All right, hello, St. Luke's. Um, thank you for joining us for this first in a new series of um, where we get to interview people from around the world because of Zoom. So instead of trying to do this in the parish hall or in the church, um, we are we're on Zoom, and I hope that you're watching this when we broadcast it initially, but also um, welcome to everyone who's watching it, whatever you choose. So for our first guest, um, we are so fortunate to have Paula Gooder, who is here from St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Um, I wanted Paula to be with us because I've heard from you all at St. Luke's um, how much you care about the Bible and how you'd like to know more about how to read the Bible and how to engage it, what a key piece of the building of your own faith that has already been. And um, to my mind, Paula is one of the people that writes about the Bible, taking all of the, um, the scholarship that we should very, very seriously with the eyes of a scholar, um, assuming that, it, it, that the, the point is to serve your life of faith. Um, whatever that might be. And um, as obvious as that sounds as a connection, it isn't obviously, uh, it isn't often how um, biblical scholarship is focused. It's not how the academy kind of orients itself. And so this is a, a real treat and, um, and I think going to be a really useful conversation for us at St. Luke's. Paula Gooder is at St. Paul's in London, is a scholar of the Bible, um, specializing in Jewish mysticism, or sorry, uh, had the, her dissertation is on Jewish, Jewish, Jewish mysticism and Paul, which makes me now want need to read more about what you've written on Paul, um, which I will. Um, and is a, a New Testament scholar. Is that right? That's correct. Yes, that's but, right. But but you but right. So where I got confused is I I have seen your um, I've seen your writing on the Old Testament, which is again so unusual um, in the context that we are in um, for the range of work of a scholar. But the book that um, we're going to be using at St. Luke's is this one, and it's on the parables. Um, Paula, welcome. Thank you. Really lovely to be with you. And um, so we are recording this on September 14th. Um, so we're, one, I'm so grateful that you have made time to be with us on September 14th. Um, and also you all are dealing with um, how the city of London and your nation in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom um, remember the queen is that is that right absolutely yes yeah. so it's been all i've been thinking about all week so it's rather a pleasure to come and talk to you about the parables um but yes so um so in we are right in the middle of the the week of national mourning for the queen it began on friday and we'll finish with her funeral next monday so what has that meant for you and for you all at st paul's well St Paul, there's a, if people know London, they'll know that there are two big cathedral type churches in London. There's um, us, St Paul's Cathedral, and there's Westminster Abbey. St Paul's Cathedral is the diocesan cathedral of the Diocese of London. And therefore, we are very much more focused around the work of the churches, but also of um, ordinary people. So we're often described as the people's cathedral, whereas Westminster Abbey is the monarch's uh, place of worship. So they are, that's why when you see big weddings taking place, they normally take place at Westminster Abbey. The Queen's funeral will take place at Westminster Abbey. But we did a very big service last Friday, which was the people's um, service of prayer and thanksgiving for the life of the Queen. And um, as a result, we, we, are, we are open for people to come in and pray and light candles. And we've got books of condolence open. Um, so, as I say, what, what our role was to be um, lead, lead the people's mourning for the Queen. So one of the challenges of last week was um, we discovered on Thursday afternoon that the Queen was very ill and knew that within 24 hours we needed to put on a service for 2000 people um, the next day. So uh, we last week was incredibly busy for us as we uh, suddenly turned, dropped everything that we were doing and put on um, the service for the Queen. So does that literally mean you had to, that someone had to print 2,000 bulletins? Yeah, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, we did. So it was all a bit, so my, my colleague who looks after worship, who's called James, um, was on holiday, so he had to come back. I was speaking at a conference in Sheffield, and I had to come back. Um, so we printed 2,000 services. We, um, we ha handed out 2,000 wristbands so that people could just turn up um, and queue and come. Um, we did wall-to-wall -wall, um, newspaper um, interviews and press interviews. And um, yeah, so we, we were, we, it was quite a remarkable um, act where we managed to, within the space of 24 hours, get a service together, which was then um, televised live on the BBC. 
Wow. Well, for all of us that are far away, we're very grateful. And um, we're, we're all watching as well. So the parables. Yes. So tell, wh where did this book come from? How did, how, do you, how did you find yourself writing this? Well, as you said in the introduction, I'm a New Testament scholar. But one of the things that's happened in the way in which my life um, has unfolded is uh, you gave me a, a really accurate dis description of what I'm about. Um, my great passion is I love New Testament scholarship. I love biblical scholarship generally. But I know that a lot of people find it off-putting. Um, it's quite hard to read. It feels as though it's for an exclusive club. So I've made it my life's mission to read all the stuff and then translate it into ordinary language for people who wouldn't otherwise read it. Um, and as you say, to, to, to pull out the meanings. So I've been exploring through my life of how you begin to communicate to people really good biblical scholarship. And my most recent fascination has been with stories and why stories can help us understand theology in a way that other things can't. And so I have written um, a few stories. So I wrote a book called Phoebe, um, which was about a deacon in, in the Pauline communities. And I kind of wove a story about her um, to enable us and in which I drip fed a whole load of Pauline theology. The idea was that it was a Pauline theology book, but written as a story. And I wrote um, some stories around Holy Week. So I, it was called The Women of Holy Week. And I wrote nine stories of women who would have been there um, in the last week of Jesus's life and imagined what that might have been like. And then I'm just about, um, a book is about to come out in October called Lydia. So a similar kind of idea. So I became, I've become captivated by stories. And as I was um, exploring stories, I went, do you know, there's someone else who was captivated by stories. And that's what took me into parables. So that's, that's, that's kind of the hook for me into parables is that, um, Scholars say um, that probably the most characteristic bit of Jesus's teaching, the thing that makes you go, that's really how Jesus taught, um, is the telling of stories. So that's why I got into the parables and, and why I think they're really, really fascinating. So if I think about why Jesus might have told stories, I, I'm assuming um, that that was culturally how people taught and talked. Um, but I wonder if the scholarship, what does the scholarship tell us about why, why we learn through stories? Well, there's all sorts of interesting explanations of why we learn best through story. There's something about emotion, there's something about experience. Um, but I read a really interesting quote um, by um, a, a scholar whose surname is Snodgrass. Um, I it's a, it's a lovely, um, he's got, his book is called Stories of Intent. And he argues that one of the, our challenges is that we learn through stories because it can paint the world and you can see it in your mind but it takes up an awful lot of space in your mind. So often what we do is we learn something new through a story and then we store it in an abstract form in our minds. And one of the things that we struggle to do is then turn it back into a story when we're trying to teach it to somebody else. In, so we store it as an abstract thought and then we tell people in the abstract and that's why they struggle to engage with it. And I think what Jesus was doing was recognizing that stories are that kind of it's a it's a world that you can inhabit it's it involves emotions it involves um kind of a visual images and that's what helps you get into understanding what he's trying to explore so how and then well i have two sets of questions so let, let me back up um how did what what drove you to biblical scholarship how, how did you find yourself there um, it, I went to, I did theology as an undergraduate, as a, as a student, and um, I frankly didn't enjoy systematic theology. Um, they, the way in which it was taught, um, it, was, it was very abstract, very dry, it wasn't something that excited me. But what I loved was um, kind of rootling away in the Bible, understanding the background and the sociology, um, I love languages. And there was something about biblical scholarship that simply captured my imagination, that, that you can have a text that you can understand, but behind the text are a whole load of really interesting ideas. And until you understand what's going on behind the text, you won't understand the text as well. So I've immersed myself in that kind of the world behind the text um, for the last 30 years or so. So, so this is the thing I think that's, that, it, that makes this book so exciting to me. And, um... I wonder how you'd explain this, or how, how you think about this. 
I think one of the challenges of being um, on the more liberal side of the church is we assume that we would all take for granted that that scholarship is extremely important. And we want to know the, mm. the culture and context of the reading, um, the historical context. Um, and when I lead Bible studies, I, pe people will ask me those questions. Yeah. And, um, but I'm leading Bible studies in church and, uh, and I feel very conflicted mm. um, doing anything that takes the Bible out of the hands of the people in the community. Mm. Having, an, you know, having insider information yeah. or something like that. Um, how, do you, how, do you, how, how are we supposed to think about that? You know, it's it's such a tricky question, isn't it? Because I'm totally with you. For me, and I'm coming from um, a Protestant background, I absolutely believe in putting the Bible into people's hands and saying, it's your Bible, read it. The challenge is that the further we get away from the first century, the harder it is for us to understand. There are certain bits. So I work at St Paul's Cathedral, as you said at the start, I'm one of the canons at the cathedral, and we do morning and evening prayer, at which we read large sections of the Bible. And I'm forever wanting to stop in the reading and go, can I just explain this bit to you? Um, because it seems to make no sense in the 20, if you just come in completely fresh um, in the 21st century and you hear some of the, re well, a lot of the readings, um, you feel as though you need somebody on the side going, I just need to explain that and let me explain that. Let me explain what kings were like in the eighth century and let me explain um, what, um, how people sowed seeds and you know, there's all sorts of things that you need to know. And I think in answer to your question, I deeply believe that people can still read the Bible and encounter God. You know, it can be the window. In fact, let me tell you a lovely story. I had a conversation with somebody who is um, a well-known historian in Britain who was for many years not at all interested in faith, in anything to do with Christianity. And he was commissioned to write a, or to present a documentary on Paul. And never read Paul, didn't know anything about him. Um, so what he did was he went away and he read Paul um, to my mind, intriguingly, in the King James Version Bible, which has to be the hardest way to read Paul. Paul's hard enough to read in, at the best of times without reading him in the King James Version, but he did. He read the, all of Paul's writings. Um, and then we were doing an interview for the documentary and he, he pulled me off after we'd done the interview. And he said, I've been reading this. And you know, I think there's something in it. And I said, strangely enough, so do I. Um, but what fascinated me was that he, he, he was a trained historian, but he wasn't a first century historian. And he had read Paul in the King James Version from beginning to end and become captivated by what Paul had to say. Mm. And part of me wants to go, and there you go. Why don't you just go off and read it? And yet, time and time again, I have conversations with people who say, I have tried to read it. I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea what, what, what the background is. Explain a little bit to me. So I'm kind of, I'm of two minds, one of which goes, people can read it and get lots of things out of it. And if they do, and they can, I'm delighted um, that they do. But on the other hand, there are a whole load of things that make no sense without someone like you, someone like me saying, let me just explain a few interesting things to you. And then it begins to open up. So I suppose my, so that's my long answer. My short answer is, yes, of course you can read it without any interpretation, um, but actually a little bit of help goes a long way. Yeah, I'm thinking of Galatians, right? I, 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 yeah. It's my favorite, um, but you have to say something about what circumcision is or it just yeah. doesn't make any sense. No, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and why, uh, and you have to explain that Paul himself was Jewish. So while it might appear anti-Semitic, it's not anti-Semitic because Paul himself was Jewish. Um, and that actually the, what Paul was trying to process was that he had this vision that actually you didn't need to convert to Judaism in order to follow Christ. But then what happens if um, a Jew is eating alongside a Gentile um, and then they're being made impure? What happens to them then? And he's processing all of this on the hoof. So there's all sorts of things that you can you can begin to explore. But it only makes sense if you can just give a little bit of background, I think. Right, right. 
so this is fascinating. Um, so how did you decide to do this, this one? Or did, did someone say that you had to do it? Well, my publisher um, said to me, you, you should write a book on the parables. And I said, oh, no, um, there's loads of really good books on the parables. Um, that, and one particular that I one more recent one that I absolutely love is by A.J. Levine, um, who is, I don't know if you know her writing, but she's a Jewish scholar writing on the parables. Utterly fascinating. So I said, no, I don't need to do that because A.J. Levine's written her great book on the parables. People should read that instead. And um and my publisher said, no, I think there's, there's one still to do. Um, and she nagged me for about two years until I went, oh, all right, then I'll have a go. And um, I'm so glad she did. Really grateful to her for doing it. Um, because as I got into it, well, firstly, I loved it. It was just such an eye-opening and fascinating thing to do. And the second thing was that I realized that every single book on the parables I'd ever read didn't deal with all the parables. What they did was that they pulled out, they kind of cherry picked the best bits. So, you know, you would have the really famous parables and just look at those. And it starts to look different if you look at all the parables. And that's what suddenly made me realize that there was, in fact, she was right. And I did need to write a book on the parables. So what starts to look different if you look at all of them? Well, so the big question that scholars always ask about parables is um, how do you define a parable? What counts as a parable? And um, what we normally do is that we pull out the really famous ones and we put them all together and we say, and that's what a parable is. But the challenge is that actually, if you pull out all of the parables, so the, the one thing I became absolutely passionate about, passionate about when I was reading and when I was writing the book is that um, the only thing that you can say with confidence about Jesus's parables is what you can say of one parable, you can't say of all of them. Um, there, is, there is no such thing as defining the parables because at the minute, and I played the game with myself where I would try and do the definition and go a parable is, and then find a parable that it didn't work for. And every time you can do that. So there's something about it. Um, and I, at the end of the book, I, I tell us um, one of the a famous story, um, which for me kind of sums up what we're doing with the parables. And the story goes that there um, was a, um, a, an Eastern businessman who wanted to understand jade. And uh, he went to a guru to, um, to find out about jade. And on the first week, the, um, the guru's assistant met him at the door and said, I'm afraid the guru is very busy, um, but here, sit with a piece of jade. And he sat with a piece of jade for an hour and then went home. And then the next week he turned up and the assistant met him again and said, very sorry, the guru's very busy, he gave him a piece of jade. He sat with the jade and went home. And this happened week after week after week until eventually um, the, he became so incensed that he burst into the guru's room and said, I can't believe you've treated me with such disrespect. And this piece you gave me today isn't even jade. And what the point, of course, of the story is that the guru was teaching him about jade by giving him a piece every week. And he sat with it and he learned what jade was. And for me, the experience of reading all the parables was exactly that, which is you can't define it. You can't come up with a definition that says this works for all the parables. But when you read all the parables, you start to say, yeah, no, that one definitely is that doesn't sound quite so like a parable, you begin to understand them from the inside. And that's why I think it's really important. So you said understand them from the inside. Um, do, you, do you, is there one thing to take away from most parables, do you think? No, and that's the really frustrating thing. There's, there's always things that you can think about more. Um, the biggest mistake that we make, I think, is to is to think there is one takeaway thing from from a parable. Actually, what happens when you read parables is they draw you into a different way. Well, it depends which what you're reading, whether you're reading a long one or a short one, whether it's a, a tiny phrase or a big world. But what parables do is they draw you into a way of being and a way of thinking. Sometimes there is something clear you can take away. Sometimes there's something not clear. You, know, you just, and there are some, some parables that I say in the book, I've done my best. I still can't work out what they're about. And 
there's something kind of really interesting about that. There are some where you just have a really clear vision of what's being communicated, some which leave you completely stumped um, and say, I still don't understand what this is about. But I now think some different thoughts as a result of having wrestled with it. And maybe that's what it's about. Maybe it's about going on a journey with Jesus where Jesus refuses to give you easy answers. So one of the things I think is fascinating about Jesus's parables is Jesus never says the kingdom of heaven is. And then gives you a definition. Um, what Jesus says is the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's like fish in a net. It's like a woman baking bread. Um, and, and you sit there going, how? What? Um, and that's part of the glory of them. And one of the things that I think is quite hard for us reading these days is that we sit there going, the kingdom of heaven is like mustard seed. Yeah, of course it is. We knew that. We've heard this parable so often. And what you're meant to do is say, I'm sorry, the kingdom of heaven is like mustard seed. How is it like mustard seed? That's crazy. And then you start engaging and doing the work. And for me, that's one of the really exciting things about reading them. Is your sense as a scholar that when people were hearing these for the first time, so if you're in the, like if you're in the first century listening to these mm -hmm. and you're in the landscape of Jesus, would they have had many of them very direct meat, like a clear meaning in a way that they don't for us today? They might have had clearer me meanings. So one of the troubles that we have is Jesus has in his mind how they sowed seed or um, how um, masters and slaves engage with each other or about olive groves and vineyards. So there would be certain things that you wouldn't have the gap on. We have the gap where we just simply do not know how all of that functions and that gives us an extra layer. They would have understood all of that. But what is reassuring is watching the disciples engage with Jesus about the parables where they're still going, we have no idea what he's talking about. And if the disciples didn't understand it, then it kind of lets us off the hook a little bit, I think. You know, where they said so there's a, one of my favorite moments in Mark's gospel where um, they've just had the feed, so they had the feeding of the 5,000 and then Jesus walked and then they had the stilling of the storm. And then a little bit later on, they have the feeding of the 4,000 and then Jesus gets in um, a boat with them. And uh, Jesus says to them, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples immediately start saying, oh, he's having a go at us for not having bread again. Um, and you, you can see that they've completely missed the point. What he was talking about was leaven and leaven is a really important idea within Judaism and its impact. And you've got a parable about it. And they've completely misunderstood and have said, I was having a go at us because we keep on forgetting to bring bread. And that is, it's just a beautiful moment where you go, well, yeah, no, they didn't understand either. And um, makes me feel much better. So how do you, you address this a little bit in, in the book. Um, how do you suggest people like us read the things that are hard to read because the concepts are hard for us today? So, you know, so master and slave isn't a neutral. That's probably the most mm. obvious one. Mm. Yeah. Um, how, how do you approach engaging that with all, with or without all the baggage that that you know that is true to our current living? Well, I think the thing that I really want to say, and which comes out of reading the parables, but actually I believe it of reading the whole Bible, is you are allowed to disagree. And I know in that that's quite a challenging thing to say because we're not meant to disagree with the Bible. But I think the parables seem to illustrate that actually what they're doing is, is being an agent of discomfort. They're kind of churning you up and making you see things differently. Um, and if actually you end up saying, actually, no, I don't agree with that, but you've gone on the journey and worked out why you disagree, that for me, that's all right. If I give you an illustration, um, when Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep, he says, which one of you having a hundred sheep would leave 99 and go after one? The answer is not a single person. They'd all be sitting there going, are you stark staring mad? 
We would not leave our herd of sheep and go after one sheep. That's not what you do. And D Jesus discomforts in the way in which he tells. So, so the first thing I want to say is, I think the parables do challenge us to go on that kind of really complicated journey of taking scripture so seriously that sometimes we allow ourselves to disagree with it. And that for me is a really important thing to learn out of reading the parables. Um, the second thing is about understanding stuff around culture. And as you say, issues around masters and slaves. Um, I think that that is um, a, an ongoing and complex area. And I think we should feel uncomfortable about it. And I think that's part of the idea. There are ways in which Jesus tells parables that, um, so I don't think the master and slave image would have made his audience feel uncomfortable because they were used to it. But there were other things that he said that would have made them feel profoundly uncomfortable. The stuff about absentee landlords um, was a really vibrant and a massive problem in first century society. So every time he told a story about an absentee landlord, they would have got very uncomfortable in the way that we don't in the 21st century. In a way, our master and slave emotion mimics their absentee landlord emotion. And I think he tells stories deliberately to make us uncomfortable. And therefore, we should sit with the discomfort and say, where does this take us? And for me, the power of the inspiration of scripture is that scripture can make me feel uncomfortable in the 21st century in a different way than it made people feel uncomfortable in the first century, but nevertheless as uncomfortable. We need to sit with that discomfort and work out what that's about. So we're, I don't know if we're all using the same lectionary, but we're in the middle of these stories of the mm. lost ones yes. right now. So we did the, the 99 and one last Sunday. Yes. Um, and I just, I read, I, a, a very sweet story from a shepherd in this country, like a modern day yeah. like landowner who's got mm -hmm. some sheep and about this dog that, you know, he, he gets a new puppy, which is a sheepish, sheep herding dog, um, but it's a puppy. It's not ready yet. Mm -hmm. And they let the dog out because it has to go out and they forget, and they forget to bring the dog right back yeah. in. And it just creates chaos. Like it's barking and yipping and the yeah. sheep are frazzled and it's a very sweetly written story about someone who knows this story of the 99 and the one and has a completely different perspective on it, mm -hmm. having watched his dog terrorize the sheep. And then one of them, of course, goes wandering mm -hmm. off and is lost. And they figure out later, they, they're not, they don't count their sheep, right? Yeah. They, they go to see what mess has been created. And this poor thing is in some isolated place and bleeding and afraid and probably would have died there if they hadn't found it and does this whole story on inclusion and who, who gets driven out of the herd, yeah, yeah. Um, as opposed to sheep or fools who can't be kept together mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or that you wouldn't leave. And so it's a completely different perspective on yeah. this, the same story. I, it had, I'd never heard anything like it. Um, and to me, one of the powers of the parable is just what our living brings. You know, and I don't know if that's about yeah. how, how we think about them or how wonderfully they're constructed that our, our lives kind of, um, invite us to put to a completely different perspective. And I love the idea. I, I would love to think that Jesus would really like hearing these extra stories, that he would say, let me tell you a story and then want you to tell him a story back that resonates with your own world. Um, I'm afraid I haven't got evidence for it from the New Testament, but I would love to think that Jesus thinks that, um, that he would go, no, tell me the story about the sheepdog. I like that story to go along my lost sheep story. Because the other thing that I think is fascinating is that it's clear that Jesus told these stories more than once. He didn't just, um, so we just imagine he proclaims the story of the lost sheep and there it is. But it's got a different meaning in Matthew's gospel than it has in Luke's gospel. So either Matthew and Luke have taken it and made it mean something slightly different, or Jesus told it twice and told it with a different meaning each time. Which again gives you the idea that actually they, they did a lot of storytelling together. They sat around the fire and they exchanged stories. And the stories were told more than once and they ended up with different meanings um, as you told them more than once. I, I've never heard that before. I love that. So maybe even many, many times. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. And, and when you, you know, you get those parables that, so the lost sheep's the most obvious one. In Matthew's gospel, it's talking about people who get lost from the flock of the church. So they're already Christian and they wander off. 
whereas Luke's version is about people who are not Christian and how they're welcomed in and the context changes it. But there's a whole load of others that are really similar, but just slightly different. You know, masters who've been away and then come back and find a slave, either doing what they're meant to do or not doing what they're meant to do. Um, and vineyards and what goes on in vineyards and how you engage with them. It's almost as though the story is, is we woven and remembered in different forms in the different gospels. So um, we have a, a colleague here who's been working on, um, on the, the uh, parables that have to do with stewardship of land or, or money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's fascinating. And, along, and he's reading those alongside uh, early church um, interpretations of those texts, oh, which are very, very critical yeah. of landowners and, and money, mm. right? Mm. Um, in a way that, at least in, in our country, um, we all, I mean, I think I can speak for all Americans, <laughs> when you when you read about a landowner, um, that is a neutral and a good and yeah. um, and a lucky, a fortunate person yeah. almost, or maybe mm. a very shrewd person, like that's mm. the smart person. And you have to do work to see that as yeah. anything but a smart person. Mm. Um, uh, I I can't. I mean, from what I've read, that's that would not have at all have been the perspective that that Jesus and his community would have held. Well, you say that, but what's really so? What, what the thing that people say to me when you wrote your book on the parables? What surprised you the most? The thing that's well, two things surprised me the most. I'll tell you because they're both. I I came in with expectation, and neither of them were fulfilled. The first is that Jesus talks a lot about families. I don't know why I thought he taught a lot about families because I've read the gospels a lot, um, but he only talked about families twice. And in both instances, it's a father with two sons. Um, one of them is the very famous, the prodigal son. And the other one is where it's a father in the vineyard and he says to the first son, will you go into the vineyard? And he says, yes, 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 and doesn't go. And he goes to the second one, will you go into the vineyard? And he says, no, 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 and then he does go. Um, only two parables on, the fam on families. And I'm still fascinated by that because families are so important to us and the way in which we talk about things. So that's one thing. The other thing is I came into reading the parables knowing that Jesus was really critical of people with money. And then I counted up all the parables in which Jesus was critical of people with money. And he's not very, the, the, most, of, most of the heroes of parables are of the landowners. So they are of the people who own the land. Um, and so and you, you, the way you get into it is you ask, well, where's my sympathy meant to lie here? So think about the parable of the tenants, which is one of the really famous ones um, where um, the absentee landlord um, has been away for ages and the tenants are farming. Um, and then he sends a slave and then he sends another slave and then he sends his son. Um, if, as I expected, he was with the poor, then our sympathies should have been with those poor tenant farmers. Because actually, um, the way in which tenancy worked was that they had to pay rent on the land that they farmed. And vineyards um, don't start producing fruit for at least three years, probably five years after you've planted. So therefore, if the absentee, if the landlord planted the vines and then gone off, and now he's coming back and asking the tenants for rent, actually he's asking the tenants for rent before the land has become productive. And therefore, my, my, all my tendencies are to feel sorry for the tenants, poor tenants, they've got to pay rent on land that hasn't yet become productive. And yet the story is told as on the side of the, the owner, poor owner, he's not getting his, his um, rent. And time and time again, I went into the parables confident that I knew what they were going to say and they said the opposite and I still don't quite know what to make of it because as you're with your colleague who's doing the work with the early church my interpretation has always been governed by that Jesus is on the side of the poor Jesus um, disrupts that understanding of wealth and poverty except for in the parables it doesn't apparently so which is just interesting so yeah so how do you how do you put that because that I means you've said a, a huge thing. We have to spend the whole rest of the time on that. It's huge. Um, <laughs> yeah, massive, yeah. Absolutely my bias as well. I mean, we all approach the text kind of theology intact, right? Like we, mm. I have a perspective, right? Yeah. Um, but how, how, then how do you think about empire critical studies? Because I know that's a, there's a lot of, there's a particular, I know that work more in Paul than, yeah. than anywhere. 
and I think it's fascinating. Um, but that that perspective on on that parable, right, is that that Jesus is telling a story um, that would point to a reality of Roman uh, uh, governorship of land in their context, and they are the they are the workers. Mm -hmm. And th so, is that disrupt? Is it disrupting like who's really in charge of the land and what God is? Is it or or, or so? How, how how does that work? No, I mean, and it, it's one of those where I, I observed it as I was writing the book and then said, I just need to go away and think about this a lot more because it doesn't say what I, I want it to say. I want it to say something different than it does actually say. And I think where I got to so far, but there's probably still a, a further thinking to be done, is that it all depends on who's listening. And we, we can tell um, from various bits that the people who were listening might have been the ones who are disrupting the narrative. So they're the ones who would have been the tenants, not the owners, um, is the best that I can come up with at the moment. So therefore the disruption was happening in the hearing rather than in the telling, because the, in the hearing, people would have said, yes, but we're from Galilee and it's not how that works. And, yeah. um, but it, it's just a really, really interesting thing to, to kind of, pick on and then pull the thread and see what comes out of. And do you think, um, so you know, the, what, what do you make of the, the we have long histories of, of, of interpretation that um, take these stories and place them in this, and I was raised on these, in this other universe where God things happen. Yes, you know, and that's very different than our the reality that yeah. that we live in. And mm -hmm. I still, um, I have to, I have to focus to mm -hmm. not take myself there. Yeah. Um, and I can't believe there's there's nothing there for us because it's so much of our tradition. Though mm -hmm. I I went to Union Seminary that would say there's there's a reason that's our tradition, right? So mm -hmm. material realities matter, right? Well, yeah. um, our, our real lives matter. Um, where do you place that? The that that kind of history of interpretation that that spiritualizes these stories and says they have they say something about god and not about our lived reality some kind of different than our lived reality i think what i i think what i would probably say about the parables um is what you can say of one is not what you can say of all of them again falling back on that and and the other really interesting challenge when you're reading about parables is is god in this parable is the question that is always worth asking um, because we assume that God is always in the parable and you can find the character. If you look hard enough, you'll find, and that's the spiritual reading that you're talking about, that in this parable, I will find God. Um, but you get, um, there are some parables that simply defy the finding of God in them, like um, the dishonest steward. The story, um, just in case people don't remember it, is that um, there is um, a landlord who has heard that his steward, who looks after his property, he's clearly a very wealthy landlord, um, who looks after his property, um, has been squandering his wealth. So he comes um, in order to sack him. And then the steward um, does various deals with various people in order to be able to um, make friendships with them, so that when the Lord sacks him, as he does, he has friendships of people to look after him. Find God in that story. It's one of those, um, surely God isn't the landlord who, despite the fact that the steward is, is repentant, doesn't forgive him and still sacks him. Is he, he can't be the steward because he acts illegally. Um, he can't be the friend who, um, so God isn't. And so once you identify that there are parables in which God is not clearly an obvious character. You then have to take that question back into other parables where you know God is there because your training, every, every fiber of your being has been trained to tell you that God is in that parable. Um, well, if God's not, in the, not a character in the dishonest steward parable, what if God's not a character in some of the other parables? And then that again begins to start kind of, so, I think when we're reading the parables, it 
causes us to have that direct conversation that you've just raised between the spiritual readings and the experiential readings, the kind of the lived everyday life readings. The dishonest steward is really clearly a lived everyday life. Um, yes, we know that in this world, there are people who behave badly and they get away with it. Actually, what does that mean in terms of kingdom values? And I, it's such an interesting question about kingdom values is, it appears to say that we should behave like the dishonest steward, but for kingdom things. So we should, you should, we should capitalize on what's going on in a kingdom way. What does that look like? What does that feel like? So you've got the kind of real kind of experiential stuff, but then you've got others where there does seem to be a character that looks an awful lot like God. Um, I, but then it's almost as though I kind of want those two parables to talk to each other and I'm, I'm skirting around a really difficult thing and so let, let's plop into the difficult thing. The parable of the prodigal son is the really difficult one um, and um, so let, let's just kind of unpack it a bit because I think it's a really interesting, the parable of the prodigal son is the one that is probably the most extreme end of the spiritual reading and if we're honest a large number of us um, view our Christian faith through the lens of the parable of the prodigal son, that um, you know, we have gone astray, um, that we come back in the loving arms of God embrace us and we are forgiven. And it's particularly helped by um, the Rembrandt picture of the return of the prodigal son in which the son's kneeling down. Now you've got the feminine and the masculine looking hands um, around the son embracing. So that kind of the spiritual reading um, is, is kind of in most of us of the prodigal son. But there's, there's something of a challenge in the parable. And the challenge of the parable, um, well, there's two, at least two challenges, if not more than that. The first is that in the context of Luke 15, as we've referred to already, there are three lost and found parables. There's the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Um, and, uh, one of the things I'm often entertained by when I read commentaries um, is that people will say, God is clearly the shepherd in the lost sheep. God is clearly the father in the lost son. The woman, just a woman. And it's just one of those kind of really interesting dynamics where you want to say, well, in, if you want to locate God in the lost and found parables, God has to be the woman as well as the shepherd and the father. You can't have the two male characters being God and not the female character. That's the first thing I would. The second thing is the father in the prodigal son behaves badly. And that throws up a whole load of questions for us about whether God is in fact the father in the prodigal son. So um, in Judaism, all advice was given that you should never under any circumstances um, share your property and share the inheritance before you die. Because if you share your inheritance before you die, you set up conflict among um, those who inherit the, the property. So a wise father does not do that. And lo and behold, the father and the prodigal son shares his property before he dies and sets up conflict in the family, just like the Jewish advice says. But the other thing that's really interesting is that in, according to Jewish law, if you split your inheritance before you die, then it's split. So therefore it means it's no longer yours. It, you have given it. So if he gives half to the younger son, he's also given the half to the older son. So when the younger son comes back and the father throws the big party, he's using the older son's property. And he doesn't tell the older son that the party is happening. And that is um, a very unfeeling, unthought through relationship with the older son. Um, and for me, it begins to raise those questions. It, is that really God? Does that cause us, if you had an image of God as being the father, is, th is that not problematic in any way? And I want to be very clear that I'm not saying that God isn't the father, but that there are simple problems around reading, um, just, just reading the father of God. And that throws up for us a whole load of questions and it, 
it's right back into that, the middle of that question, for which I've gone on a lot, but you get the idea of that conversation between a spiritual reading and an everyday reading. Um, what happens if you read the prodigal son as an everyday experience text rather than as a spiritual, this is clearly where God is? What does happen? Um, really interesting, um, because what you get is it becomes the story of a dysfunctional family of a father and two sons who don't get along with each other and how a father tries to make in, in trying to heal the relationship with one son damages the relationship with another son. So it's a story of everyday life in which families fall apart because there are really complex relationships going on. But that underneath is the dynamic of love, which kind of pulls them back together again. And what, what's really interesting about the story of the prodigal son is it's if you read it, so we've got lost and found, lost sheep goes off, gets found, lost coin is lost, gets found. Um, the prodigal son, younger son goes off, finds himself, comes back, older son gets lost. Um, and so the, the, story end, the story doesn't have a happy ending. The story has a very sad ending because one bit's mended, the other bit, it gets broken. And it's a story of everyday life. I mean, just talk to people about their families and the complexity of their families, it resonates profoundly that, you know, we just get one bit of our family life back on its feet again, um, and then something else happens and it all breaks. And, and, and in that, with we are prepared to act generously and with love and with extravagant love like the father did, then the story unfolds and the story continues, but there is still a relationship. Fascinating. And have you have you um, seen the kind of writing around Jesus being the lost one? Yes. Yes. And really, really interesting. Yeah. yeah. No. And you see, that's why I love all of these creative readings and all of the stuff around the parables is that it makes you then say, oh, well, that I now read this in a completely different way. And I think Jesus would would like us to do that it's almost as though he's saying what if what if you read it like this okay now what if you read it like that and and it's where i think back at the start of our conversation you said do you think um parables have one meaning i don't think they do i think what they do is they they pull us into saying what if what if this then what if that and I'm quite content with reading the parable of the prodigal son with God as the father, quite content reading it as with God not in it at all, um, quite content with reading it as God being in the relationships that are made forged and broken and forged and broken between them um, and reading it and rereading it and seeing it differently each time. And I think that's part of the power of them is that you can just keep on reading them and seeing new things. Are there, um, so as a scholar, are there, is there, is there literature like this being produced at the time? Are there stories like this? Is this a kind of story that was happening? That's what's, what's very interesting about Jesus's parables is that um, the answer to your question is yes and no. Um, so in every single ancient culture, there are parables in that there are um, some kind of um, either short, um, in Hebrew they're called mashal, but they're kind of short sayings, um, which are like the, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. They're very, very short narrative worlds, and there's a lot of those in ancient worlds. There's also quite a lot of long stories which have a moral point behind them. But what is unusual about Jesus is the range and extent of them. So every culture has nuggets of them. But what Jesus has are large numbers of short ones and long ones and um, kind of detailed narrative worlds and sparse narrative worlds and little sayings and images. It, he, it's almost as though he's kind of got the whole range, the whole gamut of them, where you wouldn't normally find that big range. You would just find kind of small individual ones. Thank you. Um, so... The, thinking about the way your book is organized, and you have these kind of categories of, of issues that are addressed. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about the how how Jesus talks about justice. Isn't it? Um, so justice is is a fascinating one because 
he the, the way in which I organize the book is I've, I've organized them much more around everyday life. So there's, there's agriculture and there's houses and there's families. So it's more around kind of scenes of everyday day life. And if you want to try and kind of get into the justice, uh, how Jesus explores justice, um, I think what he does in the parables is that he, he will kind of come in sideways. Um, so you get some which are very clearly about enacting justice, like um, the persistent widow, where she eventually gets justice because she carries on. Um, but there are others that are kind of obliquely about justice. So um, how slaves relate to others. So that there's, there's really interesting ones about um, landlords who are uh, away and they come back and they find out how the slave that they've left in charge of the household has treated the other slave or has looked after the property. The dishonest steward is about justice, but it's a, a, it's a kind of an odd telling of justice. So you get a very few that are directly about justice as we would recognize it to be, but you have an awful lot that kind of come in from the sides and say, imagine, imagine a situation in which there was, and then it kind of weaves the story, and in it you can find the justice. But it's not, it, you, have, you have to kind of look at it more in more detail. So, so how would, I don't know how to ask this question correctly. Um, it, it, so in reading your book, I, it, it's almost as though, um, I, I wonder, is there a, a posture I'm supposed to be taking um, in approaching a story? Like, how, like, what's Jesus trying to trying to get us to do? Be curious. It, curiosity is the posture. Um, it's a, I, I, in my mind, Jesus is saying, what if? And then he unfolds the story. And uh, so it's, it's that kind of um, active imagination, active curiosity. Um, what if you saw the world like this? What would, what would the consequences be of looking at the world like that? Now, if you saw the world like that, what would be the consequences? And I think that's why you get those really interesting stories about um, you know, where, where you can't quite work out who the hero of the story is the dishonest steward being kind of the fascinating example, where it's almost as though he says, well, and prodigal son, another really interesting, what if you saw this family relationship from the perspective of the older son? How does that now feel? What if you see it from the perspective of the father? How does that now feel? And, it, and it's that kind of drawing you in in curiosity. So for me, the posture is absolutely curiosity. And why do, why do you think Jesus tells the two family stories he tells. So one family doesn't seem to be a huge part of his own life, mm. um, but he tells them, he, it's not, there's no mother, which is what we know he yeah. has. Yes. And there's a father, which at least in the writing I've read, seem, the speculation is that Joseph would have died pretty early on if there's, mm -hmm. so if there's a, um, doesn't, seem, you know, doesn't seem to feature in the stories. Why do, why do you think that that's the framework of story we get? I think that he, so well, well, one, I can give you an academic answer. So let me give you the academic answer and then I'll give you the more personal answer. The academic answer is because the rule of three is a classic one in stories where there are three characters. There's this one and that one and that one. Um, and because you've got your three, then you set up um, it, its tropes. You know, you kind of have, have a classic idea and if you look through Greek mythology, through ancient Egyptian texts, um, the rule of three is nearly always in classic stories where you're trying to get a moral out of it, you have three characters because you get a, a kind of a person in control and two people who react differently. And then you have a think about. And if you go through the New Testament in terms, if you think about three, as you go through the New Testament, you find really interesting examples of the rule of three, either in a story or the way in which they're put together. So we've been talking about Luke 15, sheep, coin, son. You get the rule of three repeating itself all over. That's my academic answer. My personal answer um, is because I think that's how he thinks in terms of the world. So it, one of the things that kind of functions very strongly in the parables is an honor shame culture where um, 
how you treat somebody who, who is of greater importance than you um, is the key thing to, to you, the forming of your relationships. So that's why you, in nearly all of the parables, you have um, a father and a son, a master and a slave, an owner and a tenant. You know, whenever you've got people, you've got people in different power relationships to each other. And the really key question in the power relationships is how do those power relationships work? Where does honor lie and where does shame lie? Um, and so in terms of Jesus's view of the world, what he's doing is laying out power dynamics. And that's where the parables become really interesting. And also where Jesus's other teaching becomes really interesting because he sets out the honor shame dynamic that you expect in the first century um, where you have the person with power, how are they going to be treated? Are they going to be honored or shamed? Again, if we go back quickly to the prodigal son, the father um, is shamed by the son and honors the son. He's then shamed by the other son um, so you've got that kind of whole honor and shame dynamic um, functioning. But then both in the parables and in Jesus's teaching elsewhere, you have Jesus disrupting the honor shame dynamic by saying, actually, you sit in the lowest seat. The last will be first and the first will be last. Um, the persistent widow got what she needed because she shamed the, the judge who didn't listen to her. And so he reads it in one way and then he reads it back in another way um, and so in terms of the family stuff I think what he's doing he's setting up a classic honor you know how the honor shame ought to work um, and then he pushes it back um, into a different kind of way um, what it doesn't answer is the question that you really asked which is why isn't the mother featured in any of these parables um, and I don't know no idea it is but it's intriguing but the one thing I would say is where you find women in the parables, they're always strong women. They're, they're always doing something disruptive, powerful, important. Yeah, and, and part of why I asked the question is it, um, we expect to find stories of families in the Bible because we're told mm -hmm. that at least in, so in, in our context that the nuclear family is the Christian ideal. And it just doesn't exist, yeah. right? In, no, in the text, I absolutely um, agree. But we and quite the opposite. Imagine, right? Yeah, sorry. No. It, quite the opposite. Jesus, the the bit of Jesus's teaching that we dislike the most is where he says, um, "I'm not going to go and talk to my mother because you are my mother or my brother or my sister." Jesus actively dismantles the nuclear nuclear family, yeah. and that makes us profoundly uncomfortable, and so we don't talk about it. Yes, that is true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, this has been fascinating. Thank you. I feel like I've, I've just got to take an amazing class on, um, on the parables. Um, and I think you've gotten us all very excited about the conversations that we get to have together with this book. Um, you know, I'll do a last question. I've, I've sort of asked you this before, um, but there, there's so many ways to think about this. Um, so you pointed to dynamics, like first century dynamics in families and in uh, in community um, that we just wouldn't know, right, without mm. some effort on our part, um, serious effort on our part. And and I hear you, I, that curiosity and engagement um, are a value, kind of we we take it or take it. But, you know, we live in the land of Joseph Smith and, and others here. Um, sometimes the, the free range approach to the Bible is a little bit, um, a little bit troubling and mm -hmm. sometimes like profoundly problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, so, and, you know, to be, and to be just honest, I guess, at times that's not because it's a misread, right? It, it might actually be exactly what, mm -hmm. what the text meant um, mm -hmm. that can lead to all mm -hmm. kinds of very oppressive interpretations yeah. today mm -hmm. um, and we don't agree. Yeah. Right. So, so it's not always mm -hmm. a misread, but at times it is just a wild mm -hmm. misreading of mm -hmm. probably what that was intended for. Um, so I, I just wonder as a, as a scholar um, and a person of faith, how, what would you leave us with as people that, that want to take this text seriously, take our faith very seriously, um, kind of 
not wanting to remove the text too far from from people, right? From mm. all of us. Mm. Um, um, but but I guess um, I was going to say I was going I was going to say not um, wa wanting to protect from abuse of the scripture, but maybe but I don't even know if that's the right thing. Um, feeling protective about the tradition, I guess, or about our faith is I more of what I'm talking I'm probably mm. talking about. Um, but the the troubling ways the text is used um, in in our culture because um, it's still one of our moral absolutes in this culture. Yeah. Mm. Um, like one response to that is to say we don't you don't actually know what you're talking about. The scholarship says something mm. different, and I'm I'm guessing that's not the right answer. Um, how do you how do you think about this this the way this text the the, the way the text can be used. Um, and, and those of us that seek to live a life of faith alongside this text of which we are not scholars? Ah, uh, if I had the answer to that, I would um, have solved all my problems. <laughs> I think, so, so my, one of, I, I get very, very uncomfortable when people say, um, the Bible says. Um, I also get uncomfortable when people use scholarship to say i'm going to tell you now what it really says because you know you you get that kind of push and pull um i i think it says this but i'll come in with my scholarship and disprove you and make it say as soon as you want to do that then what you're trying you're using the bible as a weapon and for me the bible should never be weaponized because what it is is a tantalizing um curiosity growing um, inspiring journey with God um, and as soon as I come in and say you will agree with me because I will show you whatever is whatever we're talking about whatever subject we find ourselves in um, I I neither want to say the Bible says and you will never persuade me otherwise or scholarship disagrees and will tell tell you and both sides are are unhelpful um, but for me few rules of um kind of thumb to, to help in it, the exploring is um the spirit is life bringing and and that is a theme that comes over and over again through the bible so for me the question is not who is right or how do i prove that i'm right and you're wrong or you're right and i'm wrong but actually where is life where is the life breathing life love generating spirit of god present and in this reading of the, of the text, do I find the spirit at work? And if the answer is yes, um, then I will kind of stick with it. If I find the answer is no, then I want to say, come Holy Spirit, let me find the spirit at work in this place. So I think I want, I want to get away from absolutes. I want to get away from um, me telling you that I'm right or you telling me that I'm right. Um, but but into the territory of a spirit that inspires and brings life and love and where the spirit inspires and brings life and love um that is um hugely important and i'll tell you i'll tell you a story about um me and something that was really powerful for me which might help a little bit so i grew up in a conservative evangelical family and my father had a very very clear idea about what was right and what was wrong and um, he absolutely loved the story of Abraham and Isaac and of the sacrifice of Isaac. And as a result, I have always hated it because um, my, my father was a preacher and he used to communicate um, his sermons by acting them out. So countless times I got to be Isaac on the table at the front of church being about to be sacrificed, which is why I hate, hate, hate the story because oh it brings... God for me everything it kind of even now I'm going oh um, because of what it did to me internally as a child um and then about 10 years ago I made myself read the story again you know I kind of I, I, I it was really difficult for me but I made myself read the story again and I still hate it but I've gone on a journey which has moved me far beyond I can imagine I could have imagined then that I got to and I'm telling you that because 
I think there is something about turning and facing the texts that make us go, oh, I can't read that for whatever reason. Um, they might be texts about women, they might be texts about sexuality, they might be genocide texts, they might be the Abraham and Isaac texts. But you know, there, there's a whole load of texts that um, the great um, Phyllis Tribble calls the texts of terror. Um, um, texts that for various reasons strike terror into our souls because of how other people have interpreted them, it, interpreted them how we interpret them, um, what has happened through history with them, slavery texts, all of those, that they are texts of terror. And one of the things that for me is really important is faithfulness to God requires us to read them when we can, only when we're able to, but when we can, with the invocation of the Spirit of God to be with us and find where there is life and hope and love in that with the, the action of the Holy Spirit. Um, and like I say, sometimes we just can't read. So I, I would never recommend that anyone read them when they're not ready. But when you can, it will take you on a, a, a really powerful journey of your, um, your life of faith. Even if, as I still do with the Abraham and Isaac story, I still hate it and I still profoundly disagree with it. But the reading it has been a really powerful thing for me to do, if that makes any sense. Absolutely makes sense. I um. I went to Union, so Phyllis Tribble was our mm. Old Testament professor, and I remember sitting in her lectures, yeah. um, one, it, I mean, her command, like her, it was in Hebrew, right, her command of Hebrew was amazing, yeah. um, but taking these just profoundly troubled stories um, and pulling out, literally using the same interpretive lens, like in, in the Hebrew, pulling out this strain of life that yeah. often in the text itself is defeated. Yeah. Um, so profound that like, we, we, I remember standing, like finding myself standing up to clap and not knowing what I, like not having control yeah. Yeah. Um, of what could, what could actually be drawn out of that text. Yeah, that's um, right. And I think I want to give people permission to have their own list of texts of terror. Mm. Because, you know, we all of us have come with our experiences, people we've met, interpretations we've heard, that have struck terror into our souls. And I would say it's all right for you to have a list of a text of terror. I have my own list. Um, and to recognize that, that they are terrifying texts, but with the right prayer, with the right insights, as you say, you can pull out light. And it's the dedication to the pulling out light from the text of terror while still naming them as texts of terror. That I think is important. So concretely, I mean, your story is, is so, it's so specific and <laughs> powerful. Um, and maybe some of us in a more abstract way, um, we're formed by so many of these texts. We're mm. going to put in our place over the years, yes. not realizing it's, it's been done. Yeah. Um, so even, even being playful with them is a, is a pretty, pretty radical move if it can mm. be done. Yeah, no, absolutely. This, this conversation is, is so rich. Thank you. It's Thank been you. a great pleasure. Really yeah. enjoyed it. Thank yes. you. For us as well. Um, and we, we hope we can do it again. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to. Weeks, um, we'll, be, um, we'll be looking at this together. And clearly there's some other texts of Paula's that we can engage as well. Thank you. I hope you'll join me for the book study portion of this series on Wednesdays, September 28th, October 5th, and October 12th. We'll meet on Zoom at 6.30 p.m. to continue our discussion about Dr. Gooder's book and the chapter assignments um, are part of the registration. So if you register on Realm, you'll get the Zoom link and you'll see what we're discussing on um, those particular weeks. You don't have to come to all of them. I hope you will, but you can choose the ones that work for you. And we'll be doing Bible study together. So please do join us and you can find additional details on our website, stlukesatlanta.org.